Welcome to Syntax. We've got a potluck for you today. We're going to be talking all about uh, templating libraries, HTMX, Alpine JS, a whole bunch of stuff around OG images, some React questions, felt kit stuff. We're excited to get on in. Thanks everybody for tuning in. How are you doing today, Scott? Oh yeah, I'm doing good, man. Uh, after a long weekend, let me tell you that. Um, we were heading up to the mountains. You know, typical trip up to the mountains is maybe hour 30 depending on which mountain you're going to yeah our lesson was at nine o'clock we left out the door 5 30 uh and we did not make it to our lesson that's how bad the traffic was we we made it like a you, you're just sitting in, in traffic in the mountains which is a hard drive anyways but you got the two kids in the car it's you know six in the morning you're just not going anywhere there's a billion cars and you're just seeing that eta climb up climb up climb up until it's like our lesson is out of reach and there's no <sighs> chance we're going to make it. And we had to turn around <laughs> and drive all the way back to Denver. Uh, we, we went and got a fancy pancake breakfast because of it, but um, man, that was a rough one. And then the immediate next night, my dog woke me up three times in the middle of the night. So I, I was I'm like, I, I, I rolled into Monday in total <laughs> zombie mode. It was like straight up zombie mode. Uh, let's talk about Sentry real quick. This podcast is brought to you by Sentry. Sentry does error exception, uh, performance insights, tracking. Basically, it'll tell you why your website sucks or, or what went wrong and where it went wrong and, and how to fix it. So you definitely want to throw Sentry on your website. You throw it on your back end. It supports all languages out there. It's fantastic. Don't wait until it's too late uh, to install Sentry because then you're going to be like, oh, well, there was a major crash or this people are telling me this being slow as heck and I don't have any insights as to what browser they're using or uh, where in the world they're coming from or, or any of that information. What page they were even on? Like what clicks did they do? And that's the problem we had on uh, the syntax website is people were telling us like one person was being like, it's not working or like, I, I don't know. And then we just went on to the century replay and saw, Oh, we can see where they were clicking. And then I tried it myself and go, Oh, I forgot that edge case. You can't click on a timestamp before the audio is playing. So we had to add a check for that. So check it out. Century.io forward slash syntax. I think you nailed the, an ad pitch for them too, Wes. Century, it shows you why your code sucks. Uh, <laughs> Century's well, marketing me. team. Get at us yeah. right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk about Randy. Um, so we have a, a new producer on the team here at Syntax. Uh, Randy is here to do everything related to giving us a video podcast, making us sound amazing. You may notice that I changed my camera angle. Um, <laughs> it's looking much nicer. I, I made Randy drive all the way down here and uh, and fix that all for me. So we're really stoked to have Randy on board. You want to say hi, Randy? Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. I'm, I'm pumped to be here, pumped to learn from you guys and to get to listen to all these episodes. So I'm, I'm just so stoked to be here. Yeah, and, awesome. and likewise, Randy does some really awesome videos of his own on YouTube. So I'm going to link up his YouTube channel in here where he reviews microphones and, and talks audio stuff. Um, awesome, awesome content. So if you want to get it's a feel nerdy. for it, it's, it's nerdy in a good way. If you want to get <laughs> a feel stuff, for his yeah. vibe, uh, it's it's dead on there. So Yeah, we will uh, eventually be introducing the Randy Rants segment where uh, – <laughs> Randy just rants about whatever is going on. It's the name works. So yeah, <laughs> has nothing to do with web development at all. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. just it's just a platform. Uh, not not that you don't have your own YouTube channel to rant on, but uh, we'll we'll take it. How much longer until we start getting? It? Randy, can you throw that up on the screen for us right there? Uh, whenever we do these video podcasts, and who knows, uh, maybe that's something <laughs> you know we'll get out of this. Importantly, Randy is. Canadian. Um, so that makes Syntax officially a Canadian podcast about web development. And we are going to be changing our tagline from a Tasty Treats podcast to a Canadian podcast about yeah. web development. All, all, all dressed. So. Is that a Canadian thing? <laughs> all, oh, that's, that's a good name for like a segment. All dressed instead of we full stack. We don't have that in the States. So that's good. You, you don't have ketchup either, do you? We have some weird chip flavors here in Canada. Oh, yeah, we don't have ketchup. I thought you meant like ketchup in general. Yeah, we got ketchup. Oh, no. Ketchup chips. Oh, I'm sure you got ketchup. Ketchup Whoa. chips, yeah. 
All right, let's get into the first question we have here from Chumba Wumba. Um, his question is: Is Alpine JS or HTMS a replacement for Pug or other templating mm -hmm. libraries? For instance, uh, could Alpine JS be used in Wes's Learn Node course instead of Pug? Um, so Pug was or is a server-side templating language. It used to be called Jade. They had some legal trouble and they renamed it to Pug. Um, any advantages or drawbacks? So real quick, let's explain what Alpine and HTMX are. Alpine.js is used for client-side interactivity. And the way that it works is that you include Alpine very much how you would include like a jQuery on your website. And instead of writing JavaScript, you write like declarative HTML very similar to how Angular 1 was. So you can do loops, you can do on clicks, and it's all just like attributes inside of your HTML tags. And when your HTML loads and parses, it gets picked up and you add interactivity via that. So we had Caleb Porzio on the show. You can listen to episode 568. Just go to Spotify, type in syntax 568 or go to syntax.fm forward slash 568. Um, and we talked to him all about uh, Alpine JS. HTMX is a server fetching JavaScript framework. So again, it's it's client side. Um, however, it's just used for pinging your server and fetching the new refreshed HTML for the portion that you needed. It is also declarative, meaning that instead of writing JavaScript, you just write HTML uh, attributes for what you're looking for, and it will work with you. So many people use HTMX and Alpine together because you use HTMX for like the server fetching refresh and Alpine JS for the client side interactivity, things like clicking and looping over if data that has possibly been fetched from an API. That doesn't replace what a templating language is. is even though HTMX and AlpineJS have the ability to do loops and things like that, they're not templating languages. Mm -hmm. um, so you still need some way to render out HTML. So whether that's using a Pug, whether it's using what, Handlebars, Mustache, uh, you could use JSX. Um, I'm using that on, on my uh, Node site. Is I'm just... I'm just rendering it all clients or server side and just sending it. I don't use any React in the actual browser. I don't need it. Uh, what What are some of the other templating languages? EJS is that one of them? Yeah, that was a big one. You said handlebars, um, mustache. But like, obviously, the other ones are like Blade. If you're in PHP, mm, every language yeah. has their own like templating uh, layout. Li Liquid is a big one. Yeah. Could can you just use Svelte only for templating? Probably. I mean, you can run it as a function and and get the output yeah. directly from there. Yeah, I've I've used it before for that. To answer yeah. your question, no, uh, it's not a replacement for that. You still need a templating language. HTMX and Alpine JS are just added on top of your templating language. Word. Next one from KJ. What powers in-app browsers and how can we test our sites on it? I'm curious to know how they affect loading speeds, unexpected layout shifts, and accessibility, if there's anything we can do about it from our side of things. So in-app browsers, you may have seen this on your phone. You're Sometimes you click a link on something and instead of taking you to the browser, it opens up the website in a mini browser that's essentially within the app. That's the in-app browser. And on iOS, it is the in-app browser is Safari. On Android, the in-app browser is Chrome. It's whatever the browser that is shipped with the OS. And in fact, we we kind of have that same thing going on Mac OS as well or um, Windows, even though you don't see that same in-app browser flow typically in desktop apps. Either way, typically an OS ships with a a web view. So yeah. in iOS, it is WK web view, WebKit web view. Um, and that is the the essentially the wrapper for many things that is not the browser. And it's typically just straight up the rendering engine. And I've experienced a little even like shift in terms of what works and what doesn't in this in the Tori ecosystem because not every feature that's in Safari is in the WK web view. 
most of them are the rendering engines the same chances are if you're testing your browser or testing your app in safari it's going to work the exact same in the ios web view so there shouldn't be any issues there the, again the most of the stuff that doesn't exist is maybe like permissions dialogues or like things that are very specific to how safari functions itself um it, but again if you want to test on uh, your normal browsers, whether that's Safari, Chrome, and Firefox, hey, that's pretty much all you got to do. Unless you're getting into some nitty gritty APIs, I want to say that. It used to be where, um, and this is one of those things where like, it kind of sticks around. People said it once and it sticked around, it stuck around forever. They used to use UI WebView on iOS and that mm -hmm. was a... There was like bugs that were in UI WebView that were not in Safari, and that was extremely frustrating. And apparently, it was slower. Now, like Scott says, WK WebView is what they use, and iOS also provides a entire Safari embedded experience. So, if you are trying to embed a in app browser, you can either build your own with a, a web view and you have to recreate tabs and the input bar and the refresh button. You have to implement everything. Or you can use the Safari view controller, which I love when apps do that because it shares like login data. Yeah. Uh, yeah so yeah, totally. if you're like logged into as something on Safari, then you're also logged in when you're inside the app. The one sort of gotcha that you you should think about and I honestly, I've never once in my life tested a website inside of an in-app browser. It's I've never had that issue before, and it's, it's never Dang. popped up for me. But these custom in-app browsers can inject their own JavaScript code. So there's this website called inappbrowser.com. Um, I just sent a link to the Syntax uh, Instagram account, and then I went into the Instagram app and clicked it, and it shows you that Facebook is injecting JavaScript code onto into your website. Um, and I never try to like, especially logging in, oh, yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> but I never yeah. browse inside of, inside of the in-app browser because you know, they're, they're scraping all that data and like, Oh, what are you, what are you looking at? What do you, what are you logging in with? What, what products are you looking at? So not to say that in every other website that embeds a Facebook like button, doesn't do that already, but yeah, yeah. I run uh, blockers on that, so yeah, that's I, one thing to think about. I tend to always open up in the browser if I can, but I, I think normal folks are just opening up in WebView and typing in their password that's equal to password and calling it a day <laughs> and yeah. not thinking about it too much. Um, but um, this actually is the principle in which the entirety of Tori, which is the Rust-based electron competitor, T A U R I dot app is based, and so much to the so, to point that they're they're now going to be shipping the ability to do mobile apps with Tori as well. So you could ship a desktop app on Mac, the Safari Web View that's baked in Linux or or Windows, but also soon to be Android and iOS, just based on the fact that they all ship with a Web View, and you don't need to ship that with your app. Uh, next question, or, or not, maybe not even a question, but a nice blog post by, uh, written by Danny Jimenez. Uh, he said, this isn't a question, but I was walking to the auto mechanic to pick up my car while listening to episode 709. The discussion about what generators are good for stuck in my head. Um, I didn't quite follow the example. I was inspired to do a deep dive and I even wrote an article about it. So I love this. We've had, we've, this has come up on the podcast maybe like seven or eight times now. And it's just us being like, okay. We understand what generators in JavaScript are for, but like, when are they actually useful? And every time we come back to this, I've, I have stumbled upon a couple new use cases myself as well. So Danny goes on to say, iterators are everywhere and they are what make syntaxes like for each loops and array destructuring possible. When things aren't iterable, uh, you can easily create an iterator with a generator function. So this is kind of interesting. So mm -hmm. you have a regular JavaScript for loop, right? Like for blah, blah, blah of. And if something is iterable, like an array or a node list, then you can loop over those items. But if something is not an iterator, then you can make something iterable and you can loop over them um, by making it into a generator function. Observables streams, arrays, signals, anything could be iterable or async iterable. That means you can await inside of a for of loop, which is, I love that. And it's a great choice for a flexible parameter. And 
I, I even thought about this a couple of days ago. I was working with buffers in the streaming API in Node. What buffers were, or what the streaming API in Node will do is it sends you chunks of data as it's reading it, right? And if you want to loop over those chunks of data, you just say for chunk of whatever if you convert it to an iterable. So I'll we'll link up the actual blog post in the show notes, but love when people do this. It's like, okay, I don't totally understand, but I'm going to do a deep dive and I'll write a post about it. So thank you, Danny. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we'll share this in our newsletter too. One neat thing about having a video podcast now, for those of you who don't know, this, this podcast episode, as we mentioned, being edited by Randy, is also going to be released on YouTube if you want to see us. Uh, you get to see whenever I open up a Medium blog post, my I have like a, my monitors right here and it looks like a giant light box and we just showered me with light on so uh, you'll get to see that nice reflection <laughs> in my glasses does medium not have dark mode i don't know yeah that's bright they've got to it's actually funny because i was recording myself without my lighting on mm. and i noticed that every time i opened a white oh, yeah. website like a soft i would get yeah. lit up but yeah. when i have my like studio lighting on i don't well let's try it hold on let me go between dark Oh yeah, yeah. You, can you get it. Yeah. Very subtly see it. It's a little, oh, little me, key there. Let me turn the lights off. This is this is a treat for the video podcast. Oh wow! When you turn your lights off, your room goes from like a like a developer dungeon to a like a normal <laughs> ass room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I there's like a delicate balance I'm trying to find between. I think I have a little bit too much gamer lights right now i just got them in the mail yesterday and i i set up a couple extra i had a few but uh there's a delicate balance between gamer dungeon and regular ass room i'm gonna send you a uh a uh, one of those you know curly lights like you have your hot tips but it just says gamer on it for the back <laughs> love games yeah for, Wes is number one characteristic never never play games ever i just like the last thing i'll ever want to do with my time so that's the no that's games the joke just there. javascript yeah <laughs> next question here is can be from kenya hey i like your show thank you problem i need a way of managing state svelte stores is not enough for my use case the problem is i have is that after the user logs in we perform a kyc i've never heard of kyc know your oh, customer oh i know that it I wonder if they're working. I don't know if this is a Canadian thing, but whenever you do anything with banking, investments, um, anything that mm -hmm. involves money, even like crypto, I often get this, is you have to fill out these know your customer before you're allowed to, to do anything. You have, they ask you questions about like if you're married and um, what your job is and all of those stuff so they can know your customer oh okay so know your customer so that's a, a new acronym i've learned they perform a, after a log in a kyc where we verify their phone number collects uh, documents personal id numbers i need to enforce that the user does not visit pages routing they don't have access to my plan is to use x state in the client with cookies in a hook server to um, ensure authentication in the KYC process. A dedicated backend written in Kotlin does everything that the front end acting as the UI with minimal con minimal logic happening. I'm using SvelteKit with Axios. Dang, they got a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, why do you need Axios with SvelteKit? And why do you need a dedicated backend Kotlin? What do you need Svel SvelteKit if you have a Kotlin back end and i i don't think you need x date for this i'm gonna tell you right now yeah uh, you definitely need svelkit though because like he's he wants to fetch data from his server but he wants to do that on the server like you're going server to server right right yeah and, and it really seems like what you need here is in your authentic authentication flow that user information if that's coming in as a cookie right like if you're storing your your authentication uh, authorization token as a, an HTTP only cookie that then gets sent to your server, that server should be able to authenticate and inside of your middleware, yeah. grab your user's information, uh, 
And then from there, you can use that user's information in locals as it is in, in SvelteKit. It's a, a the API called locals where you pass it into locals. Then you should be able to check for the existence of locals.user or whatever inside of that, that route file and then prevent access to it. That's how I do it. Um, yeah. So th I would say that's probably your strategy. I don't think you need to bring in um, anything else into this. And, and you know, XState, great library, a lot of cool stuff. But XState does the same thing as Svelte Writables. Uh, there's, there's not a whole lot different there. You can build a state machine in Writables if you wanted to, but they're not giving you any different functionality there. It, it sounds like he's trying to do it. He's like, I'm using a client cookie. I'm doing it, trying to do it on the on the browser. It sounds like you should be doing it server side because this is no different than doing permissions and roles uh, when you have a back end. Mm -hmm. And it's you should never allow somebody to visit that website. Like, don't just stop them from clicking the URL or if they visit the URL, you need to check client side and then throw up a banner. It's like you should just like not let them go to those URLs until and if somebody clicks on a link or they're sent a link then your middleware before any of that rendering is happening your middleware needs to check if it exists and it should redirect them to a page that says you need to fill out your KYC before you go ahead yeah cuz that way no matter what anytime you know users hitting that page refreshed with that login if that login cookie is stored they're always going to be redirected to the correct place right you you kind of mm -hmm. want to make sure that there's no undesirable path there but I, I think you're right that having that be server side. It's so, so much simpler, right? And then like, you don't have to put logic into every single page to make totally. sure that they've done it. You simply just throw a middleware and put that middleware before, ideally you put it before all the routes that you want. And if it's at a, like a sub route, you can just put it before, like if, for example, on Scott, on admin, right? We have forward slash admin, forward slash any other page and we're not allowed to access any of the admin unless you're actually logged in this is the same kind of idea yeah and in fact in my uh I'll, i can even post some code some svelte code where we do this authenticate user check to see if the user's there um and i made i made the the wrong mistake of uh, initially saying if the path name is not equal to this then uh and there's no user then redirect um unfortunately as i made many more public urls that if statement has now if if the path name is not logic if it's not sign up if it's not roadmap if it's not forgot password <laughs> and i just have a comment saying this is getting ridiculous uh <laughs> it's just a uh, um a nice little reminder to me that uh i should not have made that choice oh that's good uh, next question from Vershal Don. Why is the virtual DOM, a la React, suddenly bad? Uh, it was a, hailed as a big seller a couple of years ago, and I'm sure that uh, this person is understanding. There's a couple of blog posts. Cassidy Williams posted a really interesting blog post the other day. Tanner Lin Lindsay posted a big blog post about React and how they're like kind of feeling like, eh, eh, about React right now. And uh, a lot of that circles around the virtual DOM, right? And pe people might not necessarily know, like, okay, I thought virtual DOM was amazing. Like, the, the whole idea of React is that there was this thing called the virtual DOM. And instead of re rendering the entire page, React knows which parts of the page to re render and it will be able to reach in mm. and, and re render those things, right? That was, that was the best thing about it. So, like, why are people souring on React DOM right now? I'll say, like, it's not bad, um, I think. But let's explain sort of where it's coming from. React has a lot of complexity right now, right? We just did a show on SvelteKit and a lot of the same, doing the same things in, in Vue or SvelteKit or Solid, a lot of them are much easier in other frameworks right now. And that's frustrating to a lot of people because React is the, the dominant framework. It's the default framework for building apps and stuff. Of course, you don't have to use it, but it's frustrating for people because the entire industry is just like React, React, React. So hooks, use effect, a lot of like the, there's a lot of really funky uh, hooks and a lot of that is because of the way that the virtual DOM works. Um, you have to worry about re-rendering. If you put your state too high, then too much of the page will re-render. Whereas like with Svelte, there's no virtual DOM. So it will just, it knows the elements to, to re-render itself, right? You don't have to worry about memoizing data or any of that. 
stuff, um, which is really nice. And now we have million JS, which is an alternative <laughs> React renderer that doesn't use the virtual DOM. And like somebody had to just go and build. We had them on the ep- on the show, just build a new renderer that goes around or doesn't use the virtual DOM to get the the perf issues. So why are that's kind of why I think people are are souring on it. React has been around a long time, over 10 years. It was built as a client side library and now it's like a like a full stack framework, right? And there's people that are able to not take the the baggage of a older library and just build something that is brand new and that API is often nicer, right? Yeah. Um well I'm, I'm gonna I don't go know ahead if you have anything to, to add about that. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I have things to add about it. Uh, I Let, think it's bad. It. Let her rip, Scott. I think the virtual DOM is bad. <laughs> um, so you say it's not bad. I say it's bad. Uh, it, it's the uh, the dominant framework, but not the DOM framework. Uh, Whoa. But don't sh- yeah. Uh, I think it's only cool because it has a cool name. These are all like little uh, little hot takes I, I thought of while you were talking. No, no, you know what? In in my experience, the the only reason like we've we've kind of split here where we had the virtual DOM approach, and the only reason that the DOM the actual DOM approach is viable now is because so many of these things are compile based, right? Uh, solid compile based, million compile based, Svelte compile based. Even that there's a new version of Vue that is compile based that does not that does not use a virtual DOM as well. So it seems like that's the split, right? Um, you either go with a compiled application, which honestly I don't have any beef with, or you go with like a virtual DOM if you want this type of performance. The virtual DOM has caused me more trouble than I think it's ever been good for, given the fact that I'm using a compiler anyways, right? So if I if the, the trade-off there is you have to use a compiler and you don't have to use the virtual DOM, hey, I'll take that because nothing really beats getting to have access to the actual DOM, being able to work with the DOM with real JavaScript APIs, being able to throw lifecycle methods onto I totally a agree. div. Um, yeah, and so for me, the, the virtual DOM gets in the way more than I, like, it exists as a thing that I have to deal with because that's the way that React does it. And that's the way that it's fast for React to do it. It doesn't exist in any way that helps me <laughs> author my code or reason about web development. Exactly. Like it's it's complex because that's the way React works. Um, and there have been other libraries and frameworks that have figured out how to do it. Like I, that. here's another question is if they were to build React from scratch today, W- or, or would any library choose a virtual DOM? And I, I don't know. Like that's yeah, I'm not either, a performance yeah. guy enough to to know that. But it certainly seems like every framework that's come out in the last couple of years is not using a virtual DOM. I would love for a proponent, like somebody who really loves the virtual DOM, to tell me why that's wrong. Um, but you know, the the not having the virtual DOM in my life has been a net positive recently. Did you notice that the author of this question, uh, their name? Was a play on virtual DOM? Oh, they got me. One day know someone's you... <laughs> going to get me to read something bad on air, and I'm not going to notice it. <laughs> when you read it, I was like, I don't think he knows that this isn't a real name. Virtual DOM. Oh, what did I say? You Randy, said like... cut, in, cut in whatever I said right now. <laughs> uh, next question from Vershal Don. Oh, that's very funny. Oh, he got uh... me. All right, that's the game now. Submit a question and try to get us. To read something funny. Oh, uh, man. Next question is from Matt May. There's a nine in his name. I'm just going to guess that the nine is supposed to be an A. Matt, Matt, mine, mine, I, May. Matt May. In a recent episode, Wes mentioned he updated the OG image cards and noticed a higher click-through rate. I've been thinking about developing a product around OG images, but I have always thought it wasn't possible to get any data on whether one image would perform better than another. Am I mistaken, or did Wes just have a gut feel that more people are clicking the shared links? Love the show. Thanks for everything you do. By the way, what's with the hate on the monster truck intros? I think they are a big old <laughs> dose of whimsy. I'm going to answer the the monster truck thing because I can't talk about Wes's uh, intentions here. But the monster truck thing is great. But after, I don't know, Couple seven years? years? Yeah. No, um, we haven't had it for seven years. We've probably had it for like three years. But it's probably two years too long. It's probably two years too long. Everything 
that is good doesn't always stay good after 700 episodes. So, you know, no. I, I think I'm just tired of it. And uh, I think that the same for you, Wes. Yeah, we, we also updated a bunch of the syntax, like art, you know, just slight, slight little tweaks. And uh, we updated the yellow right before we launched the new syntax website. We changed the yellow to just a bit more yellow. Um, and somebody commented, it looks like the old logo was sitting out in the sun. I'm like, that's exactly what had happened. And let's just say Sentry did not mandate us to <laughs> change the yellow or change our branding. This is just Wes and I evolving. Yeah, just how we have better tastes with age. Uh, anyways, OG images. Can you track which ones do better? Not really. Um, it was mo more of a gut feel. You can see like links coming from Twitter if that were to increase, but that's kind of a hard thing to, to track. A way you could do it if you really wanted to do is you can put a, a query param on your URL that doesn't matter. And what that will do is it will force uh, Twitter to refetch. Um, so Twitter and LinkedIn, and I went down a very dark hole with these OG images. And I am very happy that the hard start stuff is done because trying to understand the limits of Twitter that are documented. Twitter's the worst. LinkedIn, second. LinkedIn was very, very tricky. I spent probably a good seven hours on LinkedIn. But there's like a limit to the sizes and they're not documented anywhere. So you just have to try stuff. Um, and they're aggressively cached, meaning if you have like a cached version, I think it's seven days. Yeah, so the luck, only way yeah. to, you can't even bust the cache, but you can get a new version to show up if you put a, like a query param, like a V equals two on the end of the URL. Um, so what you could do is you could put like a, a UTM Google Analytics param on the end of your URLs and serve up a different OG image for each of those URLs, like UTM OG equals two. Mm. And, and you could compare that against impressions, uh, but you'd need quite a bit of data to see if that actually worked or not. Next question we have, I don't know, Rick says, are import star as X exports build stripped? All right, so what, is, what, what the hell does that mean? Uh, so when you have an ESM uh, module, and you want to, let's say you have a module that exports four things, one, two, three, four, and you import, you want to import them, not individually. You want to import everything that is exported from that file into another file. Um, so the question that Rick has here is that if you're importing everything and putting it under a single variable, are the ones that you don't use, um, like the, the parts of that object, are those tree shooken? Uh, do they get removed? So I'll, I'll read the question. Um, I'm developing a relatively big web project and came, up, came upon the idea of always known global variables, like const for all my constants, utils for functions, and so on, so that I could always see available variables and functions without having to remember named exports by myself, just by typing const dot. Um, I'll first of all say, I like that approach because everybody loves to just import the method directly, but sometimes it's nice to just like have it namespaced, you know? Sometimes it's nice yeah. to have const dot whatever. Totally. You don't have to have everything destructured or, or imported as a, a bare top level function or variable. Um, I don't know if wrapping all of my named exports in a import star as const is if I lose the potential build savings of tree shaking. So tree shaking is if you import stuff and you don't actually end up using it, does, does that make it into the final bundle? Um, and this is one of those things where like, there's all these rules like, oh, never use this because of X, Y, and Z. And as far as I can tell, <laughs> there's, there's two ways you can do this. You can read all the Stack Overflow threads where people say it's not an issue anymore, but you can also just test it. You know, So what did I do? I tested it. I used Vite here, but it's probably worth testing with your own bundler if you're using webpacks or parcel something like that and i created a file with four exports inside of it then i imported them so import star as const from that file and i i referenced only one of those four so you imported all four into a single object with four properties on it and then i only used one of them and in the end bundle only the one that I used was actually put into the end bundle. The other three, it realized that you didn't use them and it tree shook them. So thumbs up. That's not really much of an issue. But 
I went a little bit further and said, okay, but what about if you import like another library from within that, right? Like it's not as simple as one file and another file. Sometimes you'll have like a, a mm. utility library or helpful li library. So I imported add from Lodash and didn't even use it. <laughs> and <laughs> you guess, Scott, or maybe you read it. <laughs> what what do you think it, it, it bundled? I don't think it bundled it. I did not read. It bundled not just the add function, but the entire Lodash. Oh library. But there's a reason behind uh, that is that's because it's it's published as common JS. So there oh, okay, Lodash okay. also publishes Lodash dash ES. Mm -hmm. I thought they changed that. Yeah. No, there's, there's data there's FNS. Be a reason. Sorry, data FNS changed that. Yeah. So now you gotta if you import add from Lodash ES, it only bundles just the function and it will tree shake it if you don't end up using it. The export star from Lodash-ES would also include the entire library. So it's I, I always say, oh, just test it yourself. But maybe this is the rule, at least for now. Don't use the export star from, uh, which is the like two-in-one import and export all in one go, because I don't think that can be statically analyzed. And therefore, mm -hmm. it just threw the whole Lodash library into my bundle when I might not have meant to do that. Mm. Okay, cool. Well, that's uh, I love the um, the work you did to find that out. That's uh, yeah. Interesting. Well, I was, I was curious myself. What's that called when somebody like nerd sniped? You know, they ask a question. I don't know, but now I want to find out. Nerd. I don't know if that is nerd sniping. But... You don't know what nerd? Okay, let's look it up. Nerd sniping is a slang term that describes a particularly interesting problem that is presented to a nerd. Often a physicist, tech geek, or mathematician, the nerd okay. stops all activity to devote attention to solving the problem, often okay, at his or her sniping. own peril. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that defines it perfectly. Okay, I was wrong. Love it. Next one is from Roger Pence. Roger says, what is the difference between S3 storage and a CDN? Please discuss your recommendations for both and how to get started with a CDN for a site with users in North America and Europe. I'm currently using Wasabi S3 storage and looking at Bunny CDN, but it's confusing and imposing. Bunny CDN, Bunny Stream, Bunny Storage, Bunny Optimizer, Bunny DNS. This sounds like my daughter's room. She loves bunnies, folks. <laughs> uh, but yeah, she actually does. She loves bunnies. Um, Let's let's talk a little bit about this because S3 and a CDN are not overlapping technologies, really. So I, I'm I'm gonna look up Wasabi S3 here really quick. The the thing is is that S3 is basically just a storage. It's like an online cloud hard drive, right? It exists as storage. You can even FTTP into it, or FTP into it. FTTP. You can FTP into it and draw some drop some data in if you want. Um, same thing as like a Backblaze B2 or something like that. It's just online storage. Mm -hmm. A CDN is delivery. It's delivery of an app. It's maybe delivery of a file, but it's it's like a global uh, distributed delivery of these things. So many times people put a CDN in front of other things, potentially your S3, <laughs> you know, um, and cloud uh, or Amazon themselves has a CDN called a CloudFront, which is a content delivery network. Now, I'm going to stop there because Wes has done some more here, but that's the big difference there. S3 yeah. is just data storage. CDN is delivery of any assets. Yeah, so like, like an S3 is you pick where it goes, right? S3 in Virginia, um, and then a CDN is around the globe and they literally take a copy of each of the files in the uh, in your data storage and distributes them around the world so that when the Australians want to download your file, they're not going all the way under the ocean um, to get to the United States to get your file. You, you mm -hmm. just store a copy over there just in case the Australians need it, you know? Um, and I had that issue when I first launched my course like 10 years ago. I, I was streaming all of my videos off of uh, S3 because this was before like oh, yeah. any of these... Totally. streaming things were like available. They were available to like big corporate networks that were streaming TV online, but like not to just regular people. So 
I threw up my videos up on S3 and I was stream, streaming them in and I got all these emails in the morning from Germans being like, it's brutally slow to download these videos. Um, and I thought, that's that's weird. And then I realized, oh, uh, my files are in Virginia. Germans are not in Virginia. So I don't know where they are, but they uh, <laughs> they have to be able to download them. So I threw CloudFront in front mm -hmm. of S3 mm -hmm. Um, and then you pay based on different areas. And uh, India is always very expensive to stream to. Um, I've And there's a couple different areas that are, are kind of expensive. But there's it, the whole CDN game is much simpler now. You can Cloudflare. You can put Cloudflare in front of a lot of your stuff. They won't CDN files over a certain amount, but they do pretty good for things like JavaScript files and um, images. Cloudinary is good for images. Cloud CDN uh, is Google's version. A Akamai is probably one of the biggest in the world. Um, Fastly and the Bunny. I keep hearing about Bunny all the time. People are talking about like it's a good spot to put both files as well as if you're. They have a whole streaming product that we were talking about earlier. I uh, I'm gonna be real. I've never heard of Bunny until this conversation, and of course, you know, you go to their website. There's a billion companies using it. It is. Uh, they have so many hopping puns. It, it's a platform that truly hops. You even wrote, Bunny has been hopping on my radar in our show notes. The um, prices are just extremely low. Um, something from, I got to look at, yeah. Yeah. If you if you need, especially like, there's one, I forget his name, but there's a guy on my Twitter that he maintains, he works for one of the large adult websites, and he maintains the spreadsheet of bandwidth costs for streaming around oh, the world. Um, so he, every now and then he sends me this spreadsheet of like, all right, we evaluated, I don't know, it's, it's like like 14 different streaming platforms and like just like raw bandwidth and here's wow. the end cost. Because um, you got to think like that guy probably spends a lot of money on streaming. So a couple cents per gig is a probably a significant amount. Mm. One more thing about this like whole idea of, of storage is that generally the slower your data can be retrieved, the cheaper it will be. Um, and it, so much as Amazon has this thing called Amazon Glacier, which they will back up your files to tape. Like, I'm not a hard drive, not an SSD somewhere, but like literally tape. Um, and if you don't know what that is, it's like, like what? Like what's, Randy? What what's tape? <laughs> like magnetic tape? <laughs> yeah, like like actual magnetic tape, like a like a cassette would. Uh, you, you can store data apparently somewhat cheaply and long, like, like the longevity of a tape far um, exudes. What's the word I'm looking for? Exceeds. Outperforms. Exceeds. There we go. <laughs> the longevity of tape apparently far exceeds like a hard drive or a CD or anything like that, right? Like, you, Scott, you've been trying to get all your DVDs off of DVD yeah. before they go, but you also have VHS, which is probably going to be around a lot longer than your DVDs. Yeah, the DVDs are, like, just completely falling apart. Like, whether it is, like, this, the old-style CDRs, the tops of them are just flaking off or whatever. Oh, yikes. Um, or scratches, who knows, right? Some of that stuff has been co completely you know, gone, gone to the loss of time. So I don't think CDs are, unless you're like really storing them, you know, in a perfect environment are like great for keeping long-term. If you're the type of person who has a spindle, I actually was just looking, I have Wes, a copy of Radiohead's kid a, which is, you might not know anything about Radiohead on tape from the original uh, backups. When I bought a special edition, they gave uh, wow! People who bought this a loop of the backup tape because they were really? archiving it that's, all. That's that's a cool thing. It's incredible. And some people who got one um, stitched theirs together and put it in an actual reel to play the magnetic yeah. tape to know what section of the masters they got. So I have no <sighs> idea. It could be anything from uh, OK Computer album to Kid A of any any track of a studio master from Radiohead. So I got it in my basement. It's prize you could possession. theoretically read it. Yep. That's cool. Oh, one more thing is, so this podcast, Riverside, um, we, we get like, th I think we get like a month to download the podcast. And if we want to go back more than a month, you have to request 
access oh, yeah. to the downloads. And I did it once and it took, it took like eight hours. And I'm, I'm assuming what they're doing is it's on tape. And mm. Jeff Bezos had to go in the, the basement of Amazon. Pop it in, rewind it. You know? Blow the yeah. dust off of the Syntax episode 527 and uh, put it in his cassette player and converted it to MP4. Yeah, I think that's the likely scenario here. <laughs> uh, Maggie asks, hello, I'm a mid-level dev in a startup based in Paris, France. Ah, we. Oui. During pair programming, I get a lot of comments and suggestions about keyboard shortcuts or extensions on VS Code, for example, or certain tools. Last one was Rectangle to resize Windows on Mac OS. Each suggestion is small and easy to learn. However, there are a lot of suggestions. Uh, I suggest I struggle to learn and apply them all. It gets overwhelming super fast, and I don't have time to master all of these skills while doing my actual job. Sounds like my life is like, do you spend time on the tools or do you spend time on the actual like coding part, right? I also find a distraction from the task at hand, developing the feature um, where I'm feeling looked down on for not being a keyboard wizard and I'm not mm. seen as competent by all my peers. Um, is it even important to use the same tools as all of my colleagues? Are these extra skills as dev important? Is it necessary to be a good developer? Do they save time in the long run? Um, I think so. I totally understand this, especially when you're brand new. So we had Randy over at my house the other day. And first of all, he touched my mouse and it was like, my mouse is hair trigger, you know? And he's just like, oh, holy smokes. And then uh, he sees me zooming around and hitting keyboard shortcuts and bloop, bloop, bloop on everything. And he was like, man, you got, you're pretty good at this, you know? Um, and I think that all that stuff is worth doing. I don't think it's worth breaking your focus from coding. It's worth logging and saying, all right, I'm going to learn this at some point. But in the long run, being able to quickly move around your editor, select files, open them up without using your mouse, being able to, um, even just a simple one as being able to jump by word and jump by line instead of just like clicking or holding down the, the arrow keys, all of that stuff, it might save you 10 seconds, but A, it adds up, and B, it doesn't take you away from your actual focus. Um, once you've learned it, of course, it doesn't take you away from your actual focus and that's really important to me is that like you're not oh how do i do this or how do i do that or let, let me like when i taught at a boot camp people would just do file save or they would drag the windows to the left and drag their code editor in and it's just like command tab you know like you can tab between these two, two things so don't feel bad there's endless amounts especially some of us nerds who get really into it you don't need to get that deep, but it is certainly worth investing in your tooling around using your computer. Yeah, and I, I even get deep onto this stuff. I use an app called Hazel to automatically sort files. Like, oh, I have a syntax Dropbox and a Dropbox on my desktop that will like put screenshots in a certain location and like do a bunch of automation stuff for me. Uh, it's like window management and keyboard shortcuts. One thing that I don't think it's mentioned enough is that your keyboard shortcuts, you know, 99% of the time, you're probably working on your own computer. Your keyboard shortcuts can be exactly that. They can be your keyboard shortcuts. If a certain mnemonic or the default doesn't work for you, change that stuff. I changed my shortcuts in just about every app. Um, Typically, I want all of my video editors to work the same. So like if I have an in and out point, I make that the same shortcut in all of the apps because everybody's got their own way of doing it. And likewise, you know, if I have a, a shortcut that doesn't make sense to me in VS Code, let's say um, I was hitting, um, I think, hyper S to split windows. Like, that makes sense for me. I, you know, that's not what the default is, but mm -hmm. it's, I'm splitting the window. I'm going to call it split. So hyper S. Okay, that's it. So you have the freedom to really make these things whatever makes the most sense for you and whatever sticks in your brain. And that will uh, help in the long run. And also in addition to like what you were saying about your keyboard mouse being like crazy, that stuff just takes some time sometimes. Um, 
for instance, it's like the same thing as listening to a podcast at, at 2x, right? You don't start at 2x, you start at like 1.2. And, and yeah. you get used to it, you, you get, you know, used to the water a little bit. And likewise, if you go straight to as fast as possible with your mouse, you might be a little wild for you, and it might be, you know, uncontrollable. But if you take it a little bit at a time, you can build up that like really that feeling of what it looks like. And the next thing you know, you know, those little things can be tuned here and there as you go. So just take it small. Um, but like what Wes said, invest some time in your personal computing. Um, you'll be able to get better at using your computer, which we all do all the time. So uh, now this is part of the show where we get into sick picks, things that we pick are sick. I actually have two sick picks for y'all today. I cannot help myself. I'm so sorry. One of them is related to the other one. The first one is perplexity.ai. You may have seen this thing around. You may have heard people talking about it. Some people going as far as replacing their default search engine with perplexity because let me tell you, this thing rules. It's a search engine that is very different than typical. It is obviously an AI based thing given it's a dot AI extension and it is an AI based search ex search tool. But let me tell you the type of things you can search on this are outrageous. For instance, I was seeing a personal money manager app like a mint or a personal capital one of those and it was open sourced and it was on Twitter. And at the time, I did not follow, I did not bookmark, I didn't do anything. And I regretted that because searching for that kind of thing was a pain. I went to Google, open source, personal finance, I went to GitHub, I could not find it. I went to perplexity and I typed in, hey, what is that open source personal finance app I've been seeing people post on Twitter lately? And it responded with, uh, the open source personal finance app gaining attention on Twitter is financial freedom by server side, it, server side up it is described as the open source alter. It found it with that search question. <laughs> that is an outrageous search question. <laughs> it was, it was it, brilliant. That that's enough of a demo to me to be like, this is brilliant. It's amazing. I can't believe this. I had seen people using it and I, I tested it once or twice, but I just said on what episode of Syntax did they talk about React server components, which we released, what, as of recording six days ago? And it says uh, in episode 718 titled React Server Components, Wes and Scott had in-depth discussion on the React Server the new React Server Components feature, including server-side rendering, async data fetching, form suspense, and more. Crazy. That's amazing. Uh that it's it, amazing. And wow. every time I've asked it to find something for me that people have been talking about on Twitter, yeah. like lately, it finds it every single time. Um, so gosh, this is really where it's at. And so my sick pick is Perplexity AI. I have the app on my phone now. I have the, uh, you know, I don't have it as my default search engine, but I'm also going to sick pick the open source finance platform app that it found for me because I think this is worth keeping an eye on. I'm not using it just yet, but you can roll your own finance tracker and it is the same as personal capital or mint or any of those. But the worst parts about all those apps is that the moment you start using any of those, you get people bugging you all the time. Hey, what, where are you keeping your money? We want to manage your money. Like just leave, get out of here. I'm just trying to like make, you know, make, make my budget here. Um, so this one is self-hosted. It's private. And I don't think it's fully featured yet, but it's a really cool project to keep an eye on. I just asked it, what sick pick did Scott of the Syntax Podcast pick? It was a seasoning. And it says, Scott picked the Trader Joe's everything but the bagel seasoning blend. I have done that, but it could be that Togarashi, was like four Togarashi years ago. as well. I don't know if I sick picked Togarashi. I'm pretty sure you did. Um, what other seasonings did he pick? <laughs> So Scott's other sick pick was Valley Heat podcast. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> now that could that, that could work. be a seasoning. Yeah, um, I'm gonna sick pick the Zoji Rushi. I don't know if I'm saying this right. Zo, Scott, you're Zoji Rushi. Zo uh, Japanese Rushi. for the most part is all consonant vowel, consonant vowel, unless you get into Zo like she, which is yeah. Okay. Zoji Rushi. So our rice maker of like ten years, we had like a Cuisinart kind of cheap one and it gave up the ghost and I took it apart and it couldn't couldn't figure it out and also like I'll fix most things but things that heat up 
I generally, <laughs> I'm like, it's fine to to retire this one. So we, I was talking on Instagram. I was like, what what do we get? Because we also have like one of the like the super cheap rice cookers that just pops up, and it's yeah, it has to do with the like a thermal pop. And I was like, that one actually works pretty good, but. And then, like on the other side, you have this like really nice Zo- Zojirushi buy it for life rice maker, um, and I was like, you know what? Let's let's do the the nice one. I found it on the Amazon warehouse deals for about half off, and this thing is amazing. You, it has a clock with a battery, so when you unplug it, it keeps the time. Um, it has, obviously has like all the features. You can steam stuff and do different types of rice, of course. But um, it plays a nice little tune. It makes yeah. fantastic rice. I love tune. Yeah, yeah. All the Japanese stuff is so much so fun when it when it yeah. uh, does when it finishes. It plays a nice little tune for you. So very happy about it. And the my favorite part about it is that the cord uh, retracts. So you just pull the cord and it retracts into itself. It makes storing it really easy. And uh, I'm very happy. I was on the fence about it for months, being like, do we really need like a nice one or is a is a cheap one fine? But very glad we did it. I have the uh, Zoji Rushi water boiler and warmer and it's like i've had that thing for a long time now and it is a beast it works as good as the day i got it and uh what it also plays a a cute tune when the water's the correct temperature so um yeah it's apparently they're one of my favorite gadgets bread maker is amazing uh so my dream one day I'll, i'll find one of these at a yard sale or something like that yeah big fan of zoji rushi yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, shameless plugs, westboss.com forward slash courses. List all the courses that I offer. Shameless plug is love. Not love. Wow, I'm so used to doing that. Uh, shameless <laughs> plug is syntax on YouTube. We're going to be releasing the podcast on YouTube along with each episode. So if you want to see our beautiful faces while we talk about this or just in general, you know, hang out with us in that kind of way. Or if you want to get some more additional content, we're doing all kinds of stuff on there, uh, whether that may be tutorials or additional videos here off there. Subscribe to us on YouTube. It's going to be a blast. Beautiful. All right. Thanks for tuning in. Catch you later. Peace. Peace.